So hello, everybody again. My name is Claudio Morana, and I'm the director of Safest Dams and uh, RCA Europe ETS at the University of Milano Bicocca. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Thinking Capitalist webinar series. The recap series is an opportunity to reflect on the failures of our cultural and production model. The objective of these talks is to foster awareness, cooperation, and activism among academics and guide policymakers in implementing corrective policies to bring our societies back on a sustainable path. The series counts 11 webinars to date, but others will also be included. And please web see the website of the webinar series for the complete list. Today's webinar is on the great divide, education, despair, and death. And our speakers are Professor Anne Case and Sir Professor Angus Deaton. And Case is the Alexander Stewart 1886 Professor of Economics and Public Affairs, Emeritus at the School of Public and International Affairs in the Economics Department at Princeton University. Dr. Case has written extensively on health over the life course. She has been awarded the Kenneth J. Arrow Prize in Health Economics from the International Health Economic Association for her work on the links between economic status and health status in childhood, and the Cozzarelli Prize from the Proceedings of the National Acad Academy of Sciences for her research on midlife morbidity and mortality. Dr. Case currently serves as the Committee on National Statistics. She is a research associate of the NDR, a fellow of the Economic Society, and is an affiliate of the Southern Africa Labor and Development Research Unit at the University of Cape Town. She also is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. She is a honorary fellow of the Rimini Center for Economic Analysis and a member of its scientific committee. She has contributed 80 publications on poverty, inequality, and health economics, and her work has received over 32,000 citations. Sir Angus Deaton is a senior scholar and the Dwight D. Eisenhower Professor of Economics and International Affairs, Emeritus at the School of Public and International Affairs and Economics Department at Princeton University. In Britain, he taught at Cambridge University and the University of Bristol. He is a corresponding fellow of the British Academy, honorary fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, a fellow of the Econometric Society, and in 1978 was the first recipient of the Society's Frisch Medal. He was president of the American Economic Association in 2009. In 2012, he was awarded the BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award. In April 2014, he was elected a member of the American Philosophical Society. In April 2015, he was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He is the recipient of the 2015 Nobel Prize in, for Economic uh, Sciences. In 2016, he was made a Knight Bachelor of his service to economics and international affairs. He was named a member of Politico Magazine's 2016 Politico 50 list of thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming American politics in 2016. He was a recipient, joined with Anne Case, of the 2017 Franklin Founder Award by the organization named Celebration of Benjamin Franklin Founder. In 2019, he was named one of the 38 great immigrants by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Still in 2019, he was named, joined with Anne Case, to Prospect Magazine's 2019 list of world's top 50 thinkers. Case and Deaton jointly received this award for their work in US mortality data. Case and Deaton's landmark 2015 study was the first to detect the rise in mortality rates from death or despair, drugs, alcohol, and suicide among middle-aged white Americans. He received 2019 a honorary doctoral letters degree from the University of Cambridge, his alma mater. He is an honorary fellow of the Rimini Center for Economic Analysis and a member of its scientific committee. 
These main current research areas are in poverty, inequality, health, well-being, economic development, and randomized controlled trials. His current research, in particular, focuses on the determinants of health in rich and poor countries, as well as on the measurement of poverty and inequality in the US, India, and around the world. He's also maintaining a long-standing interest in the analysis in household surveys. He's also interested in randomized controlled trials and their limits. He has contributed 180 publications on these topics over his career and has 93,000 citations to his work. So I'm very happy to have you, uh, uh, Anne and uh, Angus, today. And uh, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you very much, Claudia. We're so delighted to be with you today. Um, I'm going to start and then hand the baton to Angus about halfway uh, through our remarks. So let me share our screen here. There we are. Um, we wanted to talk today um, uh, to give you an update on work that we've done since our paper in 2015 came out looking at increasing mortality rates in midlife. Um, and what we find really is uh, there is a great divide. And that divide in the US is between the one third of adults in America who have a four year college degree and the two thirds of the population who do not. Uh, the group that has a, what we call a bachelor's degree, well, uh, shorthand, we'll say that's the BA. The group with a BA is prospering um, financially in terms of their health, in terms of their life expectancy. But the group without a bachelor's degree, without the four-year college degree, is not prospering in any of those dimensions. And we believe that this divide threatens everything, including political stability and the functioning of de democratic capitalism. It's really hard for us to believe that these current trends can continue. So this talk is going to be a review and a catch up of what we've been doing and also what other people have written in response to our original work. Um, after our per paper was published in 2015, which got a lot of press attention, we drilled down much farther into the issues that we had raised in a paper that we wrote for the Brookings Papers in 2017, and drilled down farther in a book that we published last year with Princeton University Press. And then after uh, what I call our time in captivity uh, during lockdown, uh, we continued uh, to work on the divides in, by education in terms of the pain that people report, the divide by education in life expectancy, and the divide in education by, uh, uh, for COVID death rates. And um, the annual review of economics asked us if we wanted to put all of the work we had been doing together. And today's talk is sort of a precy of uh, the, that paper. Um, in the original paper, what we showed was that while in midlife, ages say 45 to 54, if you look at other wealthy countries in the world, other English speaking countries, the rich countries of Europe, Italy does very well here, um, mortality rates since uh, at least 1990 and actually going much further back have been falling very nicely at 2% a year. Um, but for whites in the US, what happened was that uh, mortality rates stopped falling and actually started to rise. So white non-Hispanics in the US, the most privileged group in the US, saw their mortality rates moving in the wrong direction. Hispanics who have less education on average than whites, that's the thick blue line here, um, and um, they're poorer on average than, than, than whites, do much better. For Black non-Hispanics, whose mortality rates have always been higher than whites, they continued to have rates that were higher than whites, but that their mortality was falling very nicely at 2.6% a year. So things were going well for these other groups, but not for whites. And what we found was that 
not only just for ages 45 to 54, but throughout adulthood. So for every five-year age group, what we saw was the death from drugs and alcohol and suicide, whether you looked at them separately or whether you bring them all together, mortality rates were rising. Um, this came as um, something of a, of a, a surprise uh, to many people. And we looked farther at this. Um, if we did an update to today and looking at this in a slightly different form now, which is looking at the expected years um, of life lost between one's 45th birthday and one's 55th birthday. And we look at the, the rest of the rich world, the rest of the rich world uh, is doing quite well. They continue to see fewer years of life lost as we move from 1960 to, to 2020. Um, but in the US, which never had much to brag about here, also left the, the herd. Um, you know, marked in this way. And it is sometimes nice to look at something like expected years of life lost because it does not depend on the age structure of the population. And this is for the entire US population aged 45, 45th birthday to their 55th birthday. The only other country that we saw that looked like the US was, whoops, was Scotland. So Scotland, which also did very poorly, is the only country whose mortality rates from drug overdose look even anywhere close to what's happening in the US. And as far as I can tell, the only connection between Scotland and the US that could explain this is Angus, I mean, my co-author. So other than that, I have no explanation for why Scotland looks so poorly. Um, uh, when, you, when you publish a paper that got quite as much attention as our paper did, and if you just uh, Google the term deaths of despair, uh, today you would get about 400,000 sites um, to, uh, or hits for that, for that term. Um, it's entered the language with people not necessarily citing us anymore. And so essentially anyone can say anything um, and they often attribute to us what someone else has said. And then people write papers that show we were wrong, but they're actually actually confirming what we had found. So it was really nice with the annual review paper to be able to kind of set, set this um, uh, uh, straight a bit. Um, some of the most frequent things that people get wrong when they're writing about this is that they think that these deaths from drugs and alcohol and suicide are only happening among men and not among women, and that's, that's just wrong. Or they think that these deaths are just taking place in white rural America, uh, or among white rural men oftentimes. Uh, the media is just prejudiced against less educated white rural men. Um, we are oftentimes chided for missing the rise in deaths of despair among Blacks and Hispanics, but it turns out that didn't, that had not started to happen when we wrote our first paper on this. That only happened later, um, and we, we couldn't see into the future and see that that was going to happen. And they, are, they also take us to task for not noticing that life expectancy was falling, but that also had not started when we wrote our first paper. Among Blacks and Hispanics, if you divide by education, no BA means not a four-year college degree, and BA or more means someone with four or more years of, of higher education. What you see is that from the early 1990s through to the early 20-teens, mortality rates but for deaths of despair were falling for these two groups and only started to rise significantly with the arrival of a new, much more dangerous, illicit drug um, on the streets called fentanyl, which is thought to be a hundred times stronger than heroin. But until then, um, there was, uh, what we were seeing for whites, we were not seeing for blacks and Hispanics. For whites, what we were seeing was a steady rise uh, for people without a BA. 
Uh, if you divide by education and you look at deaths of despair, and again, this is just one 10 year age group age adjusted, but we could show you this for all midlife um, broadly defined age groups. What we see is that um, women have always been less likely to kill themselves in these ways. But for women without a BA, they kept pace in terms of trend with men with less than a BA. So we think the more important difference here is the educational divide rather than the divide by sex. Um, and as far as this being just a problem for rural areas, if you look by level of urbanization, um, with the large central MSAs, these would be the big cities, the large fringe MSAs, these would be places like Princeton, New Jersey, where we're sitting right now. The red line is for rural areas. And indeed, this problem has gotten worse in rural areas, but it's really keeping pace with other um, levels of urbanization here. The problem is really widespread. Between 2005 and 2019, age-adjusted 25 to 64 mortality rates from drugs separately, from alcohol separately, from suicide separately, rose in every state in the US. So this is not something that's confined to just um, Appalachia or to the Rust Belt. This is actually um, a problem everywhere. Now, after our first paper, when we started to dig into this, one of the things that we found that was very useful for us was to look at results not by age group, but by birth cohort. So if you look at the birth cohorts born, say, in 1935 or 1940 or 1945, where we are able to see in the death records we have available from middle age for people 45, we see them in their early 40s. And the last data that we have for them would be in their middle and their early 70s. We don't see deaths of despair rising with age. These are on the left for people without a bachelor's degree. But between 1945 birth cohort and people born in 1950, there was a real jump up in deaths of despair at any given age. And that continued for the birth cohort of 1955 and the cohort of 1960 higher and so on. So that there's this really big yawning gap for people say in their mid forties uh, at the risk of dying a death of despair for someone had, who had been born in 1945 and someone born in 1970. And again, the same pattern we see for drugs separately from alcohol, separately from suicide. We tend to bin them together because they are all death by one's own hand. To us, they all show a marker of that something is desperately wrong. And also sometimes for the coroner, it's very hard to tell whether um, a, a death was intended, meaning suicide or a, a, an accident. And if we bin these together, we don't have to worry about those um, possible problems. For people with a BA or more, you see the same um, rotation between birth cohorts. But if you look at the size of these effects, it looks like people are living in different universes. Um, not only for mortality, but for the living, we see an enormous divide between people with and without a four-year college degree. Um, in terms of pain, people without a bachelor's de degree now report more pain in midlife than do uh, people in old age. So for example, if you look at cross-sectional data sets at a point in time, and you ask people to report about the pain that they've been experiencing. For the NHIS, this is pain over the last more than three months. For the Gallup, this was pain for a lot of the day yesterday. And in both of these surveys, what you see is that people in their mid fifties are reporting more pain than people in their seventies. But unfortunately, instead of me being able to say, oh, this is really good news, I'll be in less pain when I get to be old. What this is picking up is the fact that, oops, this is, is the fact that between these birth cohorts, 
for people with less than a BA, there's a real shift up in the amount of pain reported. So pain does continue to rise with age for a birth cohort. It's just that later born birth cohorts were more pain than the cohorts that came before, which gives rise to this inverted U shape that we see when we look in the cross section. For those with a BA or more, um, pain we see just rising with age. It's also the case that people without a bachelor's degree are reporting more mental distress. Um, a subliterature is developed trying to look at despair. How do we define despair? Despair is not a medical term that you will find in medical dictionaries. Um, but uh, Danny Blanchfaller and Andrew Oswald recently wrote a paper using a very large nationally representative data from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system um, in answer to the question, thinking about your mental health, which in includes stress, depression, and problems with emotion, how many days in the past 30 days was your mental health not good? And the blue line is the fraction of people without a BA, whites, who report that 30 out of 30 days, their mental health wasn't good. So we see that between 1993 and 2019, there's been more than a doubling of that for people without a BA, for whites without a BA. For non-whites with no college, um, there's been possibly a small increase, but more flat than the more pronounced one we see for people with a BA. People without a bachelor's degree are also finding that their lives at home are coming apart. If you look at the fraction of people who are married, from the US censuses, the decadal censuses, 1980, 90, 2000, 2010, and then the most recent data we had, um, the age profile of marriage back in 1980 looked identical for people with and without a bachelor's degree. Um, for, uh, between 1980 and 1990, for both groups, there was a drop in marriage. But for the people without a bachelor's de degree, that dropped just kept coming, just could continue to happen. So without a bachelor's degree, people think, well, unless one of us has a good job, we really can't get married. So there are cohabitations, cohabitation is way up. It's not as stable as cohabitation in Europe. So it's not uncommon to see people have a child, they break up, they repartner, maybe they have another child, but there's a lot less stability um, for people without a BA than there is for people with a BA that comes from uh, um, marriage. It's also the case that for people with less than a bachelor's degree, for both groups actually, there's been less attendance, uh, weekly church attendance. Now, regardless of what you think of organized religion, in the US, organized religion was an incredibly important institution for 250 years. It gave people a place where they could find solace, where they could get help. And people are finding it less, are reporting themselves less likely to find that now. And the gap in church attendance has widened between people with and without a BA. We think a lot of these things we can actually pin to the um, labor market for less skilled workers. So without a bachelor's degree for um, men, this is all men aged 25 to 54, up through 2019, so pre-COVID, if you look at the median real wages for men, you see this long run downward trend in their wages. A lot was made of the fact that after the uh, 2008 financial crisis finally ended, wages for less skilled workers started to rise, but it was nowhere near where they were in 2000, much less where they were any time in the 1980s. So uh, wages go up and down a bit with the business cycle, but the long-term trend was down, as was employment to population ratio. So that when recession hits people, which are these red dots here, are the recessions. People lose uh, their attachment to the labor force. They make their way back up. Another recession hits, they lose their attachment. But they never reach the previous peak in terms of um, being employed. 
Um, so when we think about what's happened in terms of deaths of despair, when we look at the fact that there's less meaning um, at work, there's less meaning at home, in the community, Durkheim would say that's a recipe for suicide. And we believe that, that, that the, uh, he would say in times of great upheaval, that's when you would see suicides rise. And we would say suicides, drugs, and alcohol are all responding uh, to the fact that underneath all of the turbulence is the fact that the labor market is no longer working for them. Um, we have a, a problem in the sense that we have death certificates. We have 80 million death certificates, which gives us education and age and sex and where they died and the cause of death. But we don't know anything about their incomes or their wealth or, or um, um, any of the other patterns of their lives. Um, there are small follow-up surveys from the National Health Interview Survey and the National Longitudinal Mortality Study, but these are small. They can be used for something like all-cause mortality or cardiovascular disease, which is a large uh, cause of death, but they're too small for rarer forms of death like suicide or alcoholic liver disease or drug overdoses, especially if you want to cut it by sex, by age, by education. Um, However, recent work since we wrote our first paper has merged death certificates into the American Community Survey, which is a nationally representative survey run on millions of people annually. And a group, um, Olfen, Olfsen et al. Um, ran hazard models that allowed them to uh, 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 control for age and sex and race and marital status and um, other characteristics simultaneously. And they confirm a lot of what we have been arguing based on what we saw in terms of spatial things, in terms of trends. But, the, but for example, in their work, um, the probability of dying from a death of despair it's concentrated among people aged 40 to 64. It's larger for men than it is for women. It's larger for white non-Hispanics than it is among Hispanics. And during this period, lower among black non-Hispanics than Hispanics. American Indians um, are struggling greatly with this. Relative to people who are married, uh, people in any other category are at higher risk. For our purposes, what's important is relative to having a bachelor's degree or higher, having some college or having a high school diploma or less than a high school diploma, all of these put you at almost equal risk relative to having a BA or more. Not being attached to the labor market, not being employed if you're less than 65 or not employed for people age 65 and above, those people are at higher risk than people who are currently employed. So all of the things that I was just showing you show up when one simultaneously controls for the others. And also relative to having what would be considered relatively high income, for those in lower income categories, the risk of death from drugs or alcohol or suicide is higher. Um, this follows through, whoops, if we do this by suicide and drug overdose and uh, alcohol separately, but for a lack of time, I'm just going to move on and say that um, for all cause mortality for whites age adjusted age 45 to 54, all cause mortality was rising for people without a VA for 20 years. So this is not a new phenomenon. This is something that's been happening and is getting worse with time. Whereas for people with a bachelor's degree or more, they're seeing that mortality rates continue to fall. If we move from mortality rates to adult life expectancy, um, what we find is um, how many more years can one expect to live at age 60, at age 25? People with a BA have always lived longer, or even going back to 1992, which is the first year here. Um, it's not so surprising that people with a BA have 2.6 years 
of longer adult life um, um, expectancy than people without a BA. But what's stunning is what happened from the early 1990s to 2019. What you see is that gap of 2.6 years grew to 6.3 years. And for those without a BA, adult life expectancy fell for most of a decade from 2010 to 2019. And interestingly, if, if you break this up, men and women, men on the left, women on the right, and you look separately for Black non-Hispanics black non and white non-Hispanics, back in the early 1990s, uh, Blacks with and without a BA looked more like each other than they looked like whites by the same race. So for example, for women with and without a BA, uh, adult life expectancy was basically identical back in the early 1990s. And a gap has opened up so that there's real convergence by education between Blacks and whites and divergence um, um, between those with, a, with and without a BA. Um, it is still the case that Blacks have lower life expectancy, adult life expectancy than whites do. But in relative terms, education is becoming more important than race. Um, I think that I've said most of this. I want to just say, though, that the widening education gradients um, uh, between um, uh, um, people with and without a BA is something that has only been seen in um, some of the countries in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is not company that we would necessarily want to keep in the US. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn this over uh, to my co-author. Thanks very much, Anne. That was terrific. Um, hard to follow. Um, so I want to broaden this out a little bit now and talk about the sort of disintegration of society um, and sort of living in a state that's not working very well for so many of its people. Um, Michael Sandel has a new book um, called The Tyranny of Merit, um, which runs in many ways parallel to what we're saying. He argues that a BA has become a condition for a good job, for social respect and for social esteem for dignity, if you like, is a good way of thinking about it. Good jobs for less Americans, for less educated Americans have certainly become scarcer, scarcer over time. Um, we all know about robots and globalization. Um, globalization gets a lot of stick for this, but the automation is probably more important. We wrote in our book at some detail about the increasing costs of healthcare to employers um, which reduces wage, wages and jobs for less skilled workers. This is a sort of self-inflicted harm in America that European countries don't do themselves. <coughs> An employer now for, um, to pay for a, a, a single employee's health insurance policy is about ten to $11,000 a year. For family policies, like $20,000 a year. Um, that's like four to five dollars an hour um, and for someone who's earning close to a minimum wage, that's just not a bearable cost. And so either wages have to go down or you just fire them. And what you do is outsource those jobs. So if you think the old days when people, less educated Americans worked in coal mines or in steelworks and now working in Amazon fulfillment centers, the latter is probably safer and it may or may not pay more but it doesn't come with the social respect, with the social support and community that came with former jobs. Um, and one account, uh, an ex coal miner, um, you know, who's working at Amazon Fulfillment Center will say, I'm with Amazon. Whereas in the old days, he would have said, I'm a collier, um, meaning a coal worker, and was very proud of the fact. So there's an enormous amount of outsourcing. The firms are now largely, in many cases, segregated by education, um, which used not to be the case. So that's also um, causing polarization as um, people used to mix in a way that's becoming less the case. 
Um, at the same time, the political influence of less educated Americans has declined. Um, few surveys show that most people believe that the system is rigged in favor of a cosmopolitan educated elite that is benefiting from globalization and technical change while the rest lose. And of course, <laughs> that's us. Um, it's people like Anne and me and most academics who are seen as the, with this system is working for. So we think of the declining labor market for the less educated as a key um, and showed you the pictures of lower wages and lower long-term trends, lower participation rates. And the key argument is that the labor market brought social destruction in many forms. So people are not killing themselves because their wages are going down. They're killing themselves because the fall in the wages has destroyed social and community structures that were an important part of a meaningful and dignified life that's no longer there. A part of this, of course, is opioids. And opioids have caused a tremendous amount of destruction, um, starting um, with a few pharmaceutical firms that were essentially predators and protected um, by um, politicians um, who stopped anyone trying to stop them. Um, it's important, though, the role which of opioids in deaths of despair has been somewhat controversial. Um, one account is that it, deaths of despair are just opioids, and there are a few bad firms, and now those few bad firms are in court or being held accountable for what they did. And so that once they're gone, once we close down those bad activities, um, American capitalism will return to its previously healthy state. I wish that were true. Um, it would be nice. But there's a lot of other stuff going on that can easily be explained by opioids. So it downplays and in some cases even dis denies the well-documented rise in pain and distress. And in this paper, um, which Anne summarized the beginning of, we spent a lot of time documenting um, the rise in pain and rise in distress. You saw some slides for that. So there's certainly enormous culpability of drug dealers and political enablers. But opioid epidemics themselves are um, tend to be a symptom um, of social disarray. So if you think of China before the opium wars, when the Qing emperor empire was really in a state of total disarray and was incapable of resisting these disgraceful British people who came along and demanded that they buy their opium. Um, but another case is the US Civil War, where there was a huge previous addiction in the US Vietnam War, when many servicemen, perhaps the majority, used opioids, but had no trouble quitting when they came home. So the supply side of this is clearly very, very important. But we don't think opioids would have brought the destruction that they brought if it had not been for the underlying despair and distress that was going on. There are other parts of this which are very troubling. Um, the legal system has become much more pro-business. Um, Chicago economics and the Chicago economics and law movement played a large part in that. Um, Richard Posner was famous for having seen efficiency. His definition of justice was economic efficiency and that we see the consequences of that in our judicial system where judges are less and less interested in distributional issues. They're also much less interested in monopoly and monopsony. You can't really blame Chicago for that to some extent. Um, but this has made, created an environment, which I think Italians are very familiar with too, where there's, it makes it very easy for widespread upward redistribution through crony capitalism or whatever you like to call it. Another situation that's very troubling today is that our wars are being fought by enlisted men and women without a college degree, whereas the officers are college educated, but not the other ranks. We're actually seeing this in the last few days where there's been mass resistance, um, something like 40,000 enlisted men and women in the armed forces are refusing to be vaccinated. Um, fighting wars with, 
on behalf of one social class, but using another social class to fight the wars, really violates democratic equality, um, in our view, much more serious even than income inequality. And you see this in recent American history where wars have become more likely and more prolonged um, and capitalism is less constrained by democratic and social norms. Now you might thought, well, there's an easy solution to this. If two thirds of the population is being done down by one third, <laughs> then democratic politics should fix this because it should be easy to get a majority to get rid of the guys that are um, pervading. So if you think of less educated Americans, traditionally they would have looked to the Democratic Party, um, just as in Europe they would have looked to the Social Democrats or allied parties. But since the 1970s, and again this has many parallels in Europe, the Democrats have become a party of educated elites and of minorities. That's the coalition that they built. Um, for many less educated people, um, they see those two groups as their enemies, as people who are um, doing them down, they're running policy that's not in their interest, they're stealing their jobs, and they hold them responsible for much of what has happened to them. There's a very nice um, a paragraph in George Packer's new book um, talking about President Clinton, who was on a panel with Bill Gates on a March of Senate in 2000, announcing the permanent trade status with China, telling people that they were lucky to be alive in this moment in history and that the trade arrangements would make everybody better off um, in both the US and in China. Um, and George Packer quotes comments, you can almost date the election of Donald Trump to that moment. There's a paper in the AER by um, Otter, Dorn, Hansen, and Majleski um, we document the electoral consequences in detail. Um, and as I've already said, we're having similar issues with vaccinations um, where people without a VA are much less likely to be vaccinated than people with a VA. This is a, a picture of health and politics. Um, so Anne showed you some graphs of life expectancy at 25 um, earlier. So this is the same thing on the vertical axis here. Uh, each of these panels is a presidential election from 76 through to 2020. And what you've got to plot here is on the um, x-axis, the horizontal axis, is the percentage of people in each state with the BA, and there are 50 states there. And what you can see is that when Ford um, stood against Carter and Reagan stood against Carter and Reagan against Mondale indeed, um, you can see that the healthier states were more likely to be Republican um, in the 70s and early 80s. That begins to flatten out through the early 2000s, and you can see that by the time that Donald Trump comes along in 2016, um, there is a very high negative correlation, it's about minus 0.7, um, between um, the share of um, the people, the share um, sorry, I said it was the share of VA. It's not the share of VA. What's on the horizontal axis is the Republican vote share. So what you see is the Republican states being healthier in the 70s. And by 2016, there's a very close negative correlation between health um, as measured by life expectancy at 25 and the share of people voting Republican. And then that goes on into 2020. What seems to have happened um, is that um, I, I've been talking to some of our colleagues in, in the politics department here, and many people who voted for Romney um, or who voted for um, Obama in 2012, there was a huge swing um, from the Romney to Trump in places where there was less educated Americans. And so the, the, the swing um, to the Republicans, to Trump, was much, much higher, huge, in fact, in places, in municipalities, where there were relatively small numbers of, of people with VAs. Um, so that Trump suddenly became the hero to less America, educated Americans, and they voted for him 
in, in droves. And that went on again in 2020. All right, so let's end with a few words about COVID and, and the pandemic. Um, Anne and I have a, a new paper, um, which just say a few words about here. The BA has been protected against both COVID deaths and excess deaths here defined as Excess deaths are just the deaths in 2020 minus the number of deaths in 2019. Uh, most of them are COVID deaths, but there are substantial numbers that are not. Um, the BA has been protected against both COVID deaths and total amount of extra deaths in the same way as it was protected before. So um, in 2020, um, pre-vaccine. Remember, we have no vaccines. We don't, don't have data for 2021 yet. So if you look at 25 to 64, a BA was 65% effective against dying from COVID. For people 65 plus, a BA was 41% effective against dying from COVID. And um, that's like, you know, on a par, it's not as good as having a vaccine, um, but it's getting up there. Um, so, and it, of course, we don't think it's because a BA is like injecting someone with a vaccine, um, but it's the, what a BA does to your lifestyle was extremely protective against dying um, from COVID. Um, the stability of mortality ratios by education is somewhat surprising finding. So what we're saying here is that if you say take a 25 to 64 year old white person there's a ratio of mortality, you know, mortality went up during the pandemic for both people with a VA and without a VA. So you've got new mortality ratios, the ratios of people of mortality for those without a VA to those with a VA, much bigger than one. And those ratios didn't change very much during the pandemic, which is a surprising finding. If only because the jobs you do with a VA working in a supermarket or meat parking plant or hospital orderly um, became very much more dangerous than it was before. And it's sort of suggesting that these educational inequalities are fundamentally baked in to the mortality environment in the US. Notice this was not true of racial and ethnic inequalities, which turned very heavily against um, Native Americans, Hispanics, and Blacks who did very badly. Um, during the pandemic. So, you know, the, those, there were inequalities. Hispanics used to do have lower mortality than whites. That was pretty much eliminated or close to eliminated during the pandemic. Um, Asia, um, Native Americans and Blacks had much higher mortality than whites, and those gaps got much bigger. So that was, they didn't remain the same in the way that educational gaps did. So there's a question then as to whether COVID would cause a spike in deaths of despair. So Health Secretary Azar argued against lockdowns early in the pandemic because they would kill people through such deaths. And Casey Mulligan in a paper in 2020 um, claims to find evidence. Trump also said that if they had lockdowns, thousands and thousands of people would kill themselves. Well, again, we don't have all the data, but it's clear that suicides declined in 2020 over 2019. Um, which is odd when you think about it because people are used to thinking of there being a relationship between suicides and unemployment, but that had actually broken down by 2007 and eight. And so perhaps it's not such a surprise in 2020 that suicides went down. There's a lot of evidence in the suicide literature on war times producing reduction in suicides. Um, the idea being that the war focuses your attention away from your own problems towards national problems. And it's not impossible that COVID um, did that too. That result appears to hold at least in preliminary form across a large number of countries. There's been a huge increase in drug overdoses um, during the pandemic. Um, the problem is, or it's not a problem, but in, in assigning those to the pandemic, there's the problem is that they were increasing rapidly in the months prior to the pandemic. Anne already mentioned fentanyl, this very strong drug, um, which has been spreading westward in the United States and is being contaminating um, other, quote, safer, unquote, um, drugs. So it's being mixed with cocaine, it's being mi mixed with meth, 
Um, and so it's wreaking an enormous amount of destruction. There's a bit of a decline towards the end of 2020. Um, it reached, there was a huge peak in April um, 2020, or maybe May 2020. Um, the reason Mulligan gets these results is he compares 2018 with 2020, ignoring the fact that um, these deaths had already increased during the period. Um, alcohol consumption in 2020 rose by about one drink per person. We know very little about who did it. And for alcohol, it's the, not the total amount that matters, um, but the extent of um, binge um, drinking. But it's worth saying these drug overdoses are now very large. Um, they're running currently at about the first year of the pandemic or 100,000 drug deaths. Um, and if, say, there were maybe 600,000 COVID deaths, um, you're talking about something that's about a sixth or a fifth as large as the COVID deaths. So these are very, really big numbers. You've got two big epidemics going on simultaneously. Finally, say a few words about the stock market and big tech in the future. Um, the U.S. stock market is at all-time highs during the pandemic. The Dow is currently around 36,000 above 30,000 30, for the first time. So you've got a situation where these less educated and minorities are suffering and die while rich and those with pensions in the market um, get enormously richer during the pandemic. There are some numbers which are culled from the press on the huge amounts of money that some of the billionaires have made. Um, but, you know, these people, it would be argued, are you know, they're makers, not takers in the language. They've done huge benefits to society at large, but at the same time, more than three quarters of a billion, um, three quarters of a million people have died. So it seems extraordinary that billionaires who were already very rich have got enormously richer while three quarters of a million people died. Um, I think people ought to be thinking about wealth taxes, but it's just not conceivable really in the political um, environment in America today. The British Labour Party in World War II demanded a conscription of capital to match the conscription of labour. And for much of immediate post-war Europe, there were very high taxes on income for those reasons indeed. The stock market values profits, not wages, and so the very high levels of the stock market may simply represent a permanent shift towards tech. And the last slide shows just the extraordinary extent. Oh, oops. Um, uh -huh. wait a minute. Let's just go back to this. And you, that's the one. Yeah. Um, and I'm down there somewhere. Yeah, I just wanted to show you this. This shows the total amount. This is from the um, Board of Governors. Um, this shows total household wealth in trillions of dollars up to the second quarter of 2021. We see the enormous increases during the pandemic. Um, and also this shows the division between people with a VA and people without a VA. If you go back to 1990, that wealth was about equally split between people with and without a VA. Whereas now people with a BA have three quarters um, of total wealth in the US. So there's been a huge redistribution of wealth as well as health um, towards people with a college degree. So thanks very much. I'll stop there and we'll hand over to Massimo. Two thank you, thank you Nacho, for, for your most interesting uh, uh, seminar. Um, well, just to say a few words about uh, our uh, discussant before uh, giving the floor for this uh, discussion. So our discussant is Professor Massimo Bordignon. Massimo Bordignon gained a first degree in philosophy at the University of Florence. He then moved to the UK to attend postgraduate studies in economics. His research interests are mainly concentrated on welfare economics, public economics, and political economics. The author of six books, he has published extensively in many national and international journals and is associated editor of Italian and international journals. He is also active in the public debate and has written extensively on the main Italian newspapers. He was also a co-founder and the main contributor of the online magazine La Voce. 
He taught at Birmingham University, the University of Bergamo, Brescia, and Venezia, and as visiting professor in doctoral and master courses in Sweden, Germany, Belgium, and China. He is currently full professor of public economics at the Catholic University of Milan, where he also directs the Department of Economics and Finance in the Graduate School in Economics. He was president of the Italian Society of Public Economics, a member of the managing board of the International Institute of Public Finance, and member of the scientific advisory board of IFO Munich. He was also a visiting fellow at the Think Tank Bruegel, and is currently fellow of several scientific and cultural uh, bodies. As chairman of CIFRA, an inter-university applied research center in public economics, he directed several research for national and international bodies, including <clears throat> European Parliament. He also worked as a consultant for the Italian Treasury and for several international organizations, in particular the Fiscal Affairs Department of the International Monetary Fund. He is a member of the European Fiscal Board, acting as special advisor for the President of the European Commission. Massimo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can see my slide. Otherwise, tell me, please. Oh, yes. First of all, it is a pleasure and an honor. I mean, this is the first time that I discuss a Nobel Prize winner, so it's really an honor. I would like to start with a, a quick summary, but I'm going to be very fast because the author presented very well the, uh, the, the, the topic, uh, so there is no need to spend too much time here. I have a couple of, uh, you know, referee-like curiosity, the kind of curiosity the referee would ask. And then uh, I'm asking another couple of questions, which uh, I think this is uh, to open more the discussion than anything else. The first one uh, is what has been described a problem of American capitalism or a problem more general capitalism? And then uh, what's going to happen after COVID? So in terms of uh, the, the story, you heard it already. There is a general story which has been presented in the book in several previous papers. Other paper is clearly a project which is going on. And the story is basically what you heard. So since 1970, because of globalization, technological change, US specific problem, there was a generalized collapse of the way of life among not college educated white American, which they call W. And H with no BA, which is, however, a large part of the American population. We are talking about two thirds, certainly more than 60%, even with the rise of college enrollment reason. People that traditionally work in manufacturing. And, uh, you know, what's happened because of uh, this change in life, there was lack of decent job, decent wage, increased work instability, unemployment, which led to a loss of dignity, life meaning, and the collapse of. Uh, social relationship in this group. And the author, particularly in the book, but even here, the discussion we just had, document the effect of this, not only on the labor market, but also on deteriorating mental health, increasing reported pain, failing marriage, failing community, increase in out of wet lock beds, and so on. And of course, including a sharp increase in the deaths of despair. So the deaths which are due to suicide or drug of alcohol related debt. Life expectancy fell for this group and not for the white with a bachelor degree or more. And at least initially that was interesting, not for other minorities such as black and age with no BA. Then it started increasing later on when they, there was this, 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 this fusion of drug. And so they also make this comment, which is also very interesting that education rather than race is increasingly becoming the source of the great, great divide in the US. And a large part of this increased debt is drug related. And this is also the result of another American peculiarity, the opioids and pimedics. In the 2000s, there was a legalization of the diffusion of option-based pharmaceutical drugs. The apparently American doctor happily prescribed to patients. And when they stopped doing so, patients which are now become addicted move to illegal drugs, often killing themselves as a result. OK, the, the paper, I'm not going to enter in the paper because it's already been discussed. Let me expand some of, uh, discuss some additional evidence, address some criticism, ask what happened with the COVID, but the data, data are limited, add some other comparison, 
discuss correlation between life expectancy for US different groups. And the bottom line is basically that not much has changed with the COVID-19. There has not been an increase in the suicide rates. And in a sense, they make the argument it was wrong to expect it to happen. But at the end, uh, uh, white with no uh, education kept dying at a faster rate than uh, white with education. And then also there is no sign that the drug-related deaths are diminishing about among the white, not educated, not Hispanic, and not educated people. OK, so comment. Well, the, my first comment is that, of course, it's a great work and also a great book. Let me say that I believe the general story is consistent with several other accounts, not only from economists. For example, there is this, including novels. So for example, there is this book, which is worth reading, which is called Hilly Bill Elegy or Watch the Movie. And it's also interesting because the different from the author, this guy is a believer in the American system. Nevertheless, the kind of description they have that he gives in terms of the destruction, the desperation is very much in line. And it's also in line with my own experience, personal experience. I mean, not anything so dramatic by living an ex-industrial town. And I could see with my face what's happened when the manufacturer basically disappeared in just a couple of decades. And to me, what makes the story particularly convincing is all the abundance of corroborative evidence, not just the specific analysis of death or despair. However, it is impressive. And uh, in a sense, I certainly agree with the point that, that uh, the author makes. One of the main criticisms to, uh, uh, to the death or despair um, argument is that at the end, uh, it's just a matter of obvious av availability. Is the epidemic of poets which created the death? That uh, depth is not so much a matter of despair, but as they said, that I completely agree. Opium availability is a supply factor, but one also need to explain the demand side why people decide to drag themselves to death. Okay, just two point. I mean, one uh, about uh, you know the, the kind of point that two, uh, a referee could um, uh, rise. One uh, which I found a bit surprised that both in the book and in the paper there is not really much discussion of. Uh, a selection problem. I mean, uh, who uh, who are the people who go to college in the US? You know, probably these are people which are quite different from people who do not. Probably they were just coming from richer, more stable family. Hence, they might have a healthier lifestyle to begin with. And so it might be not education per se that explains the increasing different life expectancy, but this original difference. Let me say that I don't think, uh, I don't uh, believe that this, uh, uh, this uh, you know, uh, Remark is very important, but anyhow, it would be interesting to hear what they say. I don't think it's very much important because of all the general evidence which is, has been put forward by the author. And also because there is this fact which is interesting that uh, this difference is really linked to obtaining a BA, not so much to go to college uh, as such. Another thing which I found a bit uh, strange is that, uh, you know, there is not so much discussion in a book about the college white premium. Why the college white premium is so large and increase in the US? To be more precise, there is a detailed discussion of the book, we heard something here, of why wages are low at the low level, say, because we had the deionization of sourcing too low federal minimum wage, uh, which uh, and the, and the fact that uh, the ever increasing health care costs are basically financed with the tax of wages, which push employers either to fire people or to impose a lower wage or to give a lower wage. But there is not much discussion on why wages are so high for uh, white, uh, not Hispanic with a uh, high level of education. There is um, in the book, there is just some kind of reference to skill bias, technological change that increase the demand for skill level. And this is a bit surprised because if you look to continental Europe, uh, which also went through this uh, same technological revolution, we nevertheless, the cost of, of uh, the cost of uh, the, the premium of, uh, on, uh, on education is both lower and is not much increasing. And actually in some countries, including mine, but even in Sweden and other, actually appear to have been uh, reducing. So, I mean, what I'm saying is that the institutional rather the economic factor is probably at work here. Certainly there is a role of unions which tend to compress wage distribution and the labor legislation. But perhaps there is also some, some other thing which is going on. I mean, it looks like a, a sort of equilibrium, you see, that because 
In the US, college education is very costly. Okay, American professors also pay much more than European profession and so on. And therefore, I mean, in a sense, in the US, you require a high, uh, a high premium, wage premium to justify this cost. In continental Europe, college education is almost free for charge. And I'd imagine the return to higher education is clearly small. So there is this also this institutional difference, which would be interesting to discuss. I mean, how, how come the education has become so important in the US? It cannot only be an economic uh, fact. Uh, another point, uh, let, let me just notice in passing that uh, clearly a, a low cost of wage premium might be good for equality, but clearly is not so much good, or could not be so much good for efficient efficient allocation of labor. So for example, in the book, Angus mentioned it, there is some criticism of meritocracy in the sense that there's some kind of justification for social Darwinism in a sense, which I, you know, I completely understand, I agree with. But let me also say that living in a country like Italy with no meritocracy at all, one can also see the other side of the coin. A stagnant society with little incentive for personal improvement and depressingly low intergenerational mobility. So I think that here some kind of midway solution would be probably optimal. Uh, let me just turn now to the other, to the, 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 you know, the more general point which is raised by this, by this book. I mean, what we have been discussing is a problem for America or is a problem for capitalists in general? Eh? And if you read the book, the impression that you have is that this is really a problem for American capitalists, not more generally. Because if you look to Europe, you don't have any of the effects that we discussed, perhaps with some section like Scotland, as we heard before. Educated people obviously live longer, this happens everywhere, but there is no diverging trend in life expectancy. There is no increase in debt to despair among the less educated. And uh, in Europe, of course, there are larger social safety nets, or at least family safety nets in Europe. Universal care coverage is basically available everywhere, and we never had an opioids epidemic, not in, in comparison. I mean, an Italian doctor will never give you an opiation for, uh, uh, for pain without any specific uh, reason. So if you look to the kind of description, the conclusion would be, well, it's a problem of American capital, not so much of capital as such. But in reality, I'm not so sure. And there are a number of pieces which make me, um, I mean, doubtful of the, about that. First of all, I mean, there is this fact that the labor share is on GDP is declining everywhere. If you look, for example, in Italy, and I have been working on that, so I can be a bit more precise, precise it went down from 75% in the 70s to just 53% in 2019, okay? And this, this kind of, of pressure is, is happening everywhere, in the US, in most European countries. Let me also say that uh, exactly because it's so widespread, I'm not much convinced by author superstar explanation because that seems to be more related to what's happening in the US rather than Europe, while this effect is more general. Then uh, the, the author also make this point uh, say, well, okay, I mean, in uh, the bad thing about the American system, and you also want to, to finance this uh, ever-increasing cost for healthcare with tax or wage. In Europe, what we do is that we tend to finance healthcare system and more general social transfer with general taxation. Yeah, this is true, but it's true up to a point, because then if you want to look, if you go and you look at what is inside general taxation, you will see that this is, again, largely based on tax and labor income. And pension are also, in Europe, are also funded by contribution on labor income. So at the end, there is not such a stark difference as one can think about. And uh, you know, with the digital revolution, taxing top labor income is becoming increasingly difficult. People can move and work in low income tax jurisdiction, and this is, can, already happened in Italy. I mean, in Italy, if you just, uh, you know, if you work on, on online you, with, uh, you know, uh, if you drive just a few hours, you can go to Slovenia and you will reduce by half of your uh, tax burden. So, I mean, it's no longer a pro. Once we were used to think that capital is mobile, a labor, no, sorry, labor is immobile, a capital is mobile, but now it's becoming less and less true. Bottom line, and this is one thing which I think 
is quite important. Either we find some way to move the burden of taxation to other sources, corporate capital income, consumption, wealth, we can discuss. Or the funding of the European welfare system, I think is a serious risk, particularly with an aging population. So this kind of problem is emerging, is going to emerge even more strongly in the future. Uh, we had done some progress, as you know, recently, thanks to the Biden administration, coming back to that on a proposal to impose uh, some more taxation on, uh, say, multinational, but we are very, very far from what we would need. And in the, UK, in the European <laughs> Union, several countries are just tax havens. And of course, uh, so th this is uh, one similarity that I see, and there are at least uh, another couple of common factors. First, uh, the kind of discussion that they had about uh, how uh, workers shift their political preference, their political alliance from the left to the right or to the extreme right and increased polarization. This is exactly the same as happened in many European countries, although perhaps still at a lower extent. So we do have a general problem of loss of legitimacy for democratic institution. And this is a serious common threat for our democracy. So, we need to be a more consensual society, even if uh, it's hard to say how to do it, but certainly distribution, social net, this is part uh, of uh, what in it. And secondly, I mean, they, they, they make some reference there, but they don't discuss these things very much because this is really looking a bit more the future according to some author, like for example, Baldwin, the globotics have feel, so, the diffusion of artificial intelligence and globalization service now threaten the well-paying jobs, the, the jobs of the white collar, of the professional, our job including. So they want to be, they call the white, not Hispanic with a bachelor in the US. And uh, clearly arranging, managing this technological transition will be one of the most difficult the task in the future for capitalist democracy talking about US or, uh, or the Europe. I mean, this is going to be one of the big issues in the future. To conclude, let me just ask a question about what uh, the auto think about what's going to happen after the COVID. Now, if you look at how to the situation after the financial crisis, Europe did much worse than the US in general. I mean, at least if you look as an indicator GDP, some countries did reasonable well, but I don't think for reason I cannot explain here that is better performance as solid foundation. Productivity in Europe has fallen everywhere as a result of decreasing public and private investment. And Italy, a part of Southern Europe, did the particularly bad. If uh, in the US, in a sense, the problem is how to distribute better the benefits of growth across the population, in Italy, there was simply no growth, so nothing to distribute. Now, paradoxically, in a sense, paradoxically, the COVID pandemic changed the situation. At the moment, your countries are now spending heavily and collectively with uh, issuing common debt to support energy transition digital progress. And in the last months, at least the rebound in the European Union is actually stronger than the US. So it's clearly that uh, the energy digital transition will create a huge problem in your economy, but at least is unlikely we go back to the kind of blind austerity that we had before. So there is some hopes, at least at least some hope for the future in terms of starting growing again. So having more, the cake will become bigger. So maybe we can have more redistribution that we had in the past. And here is the question for the author. What's happening in the US? Are the Biden plans on investing heavily in rebuilding infrastructure enlarging the social safety net going to reduce the great divide and increase the desperation, desperation the divide, that the divide brings about in part of American society. Specifically, the Congress just approved one, a bill for one, one comma nine trillion dollars. Do you think that is, and a lot of the things are inside the spend healthcare, support earning for the lower class, go in the direction of that one, my wish. So my question is, do you think this is going to make a difference in the future? Thank you. I stop here. Want us to say a few words now, Claudia? Yes, please go ahead. This is just terrific. Um, it's um, 
one of the problems with these Zoom events is we don't often get discussed. So we're, we're, it's really valuable to get good, well thought out comments um, on the whole range of work. Let me say a few words about politics and the European US um, divide. And I'll say that and then Anne will maybe say something about education. And we see there's some questions about that too. So on, on that, I think we would agree that it's a matter of degree um, between the US um, and the um, and Europe, and that many of the factors, especially the political factors and the disenfranchisement of the working classes and the re, the, the threat from the extreme right are, are quite common um, across countries. Um, uh, the Massimo made a remark about um, you know, the, the no growth in Italy, but in some cases that makes it worse because with nothing to divide, the only way you can get better off is by hurting someone else. And so it makes polarization even worse. And I, I, I personally think that a lot of the problems in the US and in all of Western Europe come from slowing growth over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, which has made these distributional issues uh, much more severe. Let me just say a few things that defend a little bit the special case of the US. Uh, we agree very much with what Masmo said. There are better regulations of healthcare providers, for one thing. Now, some of that, of course, is because of our crazy political system, so that um, politicians need enormous sums of money, including for pharmaceutical companies, which makes the regulation of them appallingly bad. And that's a very difficult thing to break. Um, the politicians deserve just as much blame um, for the opioid crisis as the pharma manufacturers do, um, at least in my view. On the raising, I mean, raising money for healthcare everywhere is a big problem. Um, because healthcare is getting more expensive everywhere. But the point to make is that, um, you know, healthcare here costs twice as much as it costs in most European countries. So the question of financing becomes all the more important just because it's so much bigger, right? And also, while it's true that in most countries it's funded through taxes on labor income, we have a peculiar system where it's a flat tax so that everybody pays the same. Whereas in Europe, um, and even in Italy, actually, that's not the case. I mean, if you earn more, you pay more into the healthcare system, you pay more into the pension system. And that's true for pensions here, but it's not true for healthcare in that basically the 20,000 family premium is paid whether you're a janitor or whether you're the CEO of the company. So that inserts this enormous wedge at the bottom of the labor market and is screwing everything up. And you don't have that in Europe to the same extent. So, but I think these deep underlying problems about late stage capitalism, which is what some people call it, are pretty widespread. And the US, as is often the case, is hurting itself even worse than anyone else by its incredibly dysfunctional political system. I think what Biden's trying to do is along the right lines, and it would help less educated Americans. Um, Janet Yellen is a good friend of ours. I supported this work from day one. And, but you know, the, one of the big problems is trying to rein in healthcare costs. And the Biden administration is not, I think, capable of doing that. Maybe Anne would like to say something about education. Sure. Thank you. Th th those remarks are terrific. Thank you so much. Um, the selection issues with college are, are certainly something that, sh that one needs to keep in mind. Um, one of the reasons we chose the, to divide this along the line of having a four-year degree or not is that that was the margin that had changed the least over the period of time that we're studying. So, for example, if we had chosen to divide this by not having completed high school or not, then what you see is that over this period of time, uh, the portion without any high school diploma plummeted and the people who are left without it are sicker, they probably have mental health issues, and one would worry a lot about saying something about trends over time there. With, with getting a college with a BA, a lot more people are starting a four-year degree. The completion rates, though, have been nosing up just slowly over time. 
So yes, for sure, that is something that as in any um, labor market study looking at the returns to a college degree, one needs to worry about selection. But um, we think that we, we really, that divide seemed to us to be the most reasonable one uh, to choose. Um, on finding a middle ground on meritocracy, that would be fabulous. I, I don't know how we do that. Um, we talk about that a lot because that would seem to be something that would help. In the US, what it would mean is um, also valuing the jobs that are being done by people who have a skill set that's different from a college skill set, people who could do technical things and do them well, things that don't require a BA, but currently uh, as a screening device, a BA is used. If we could somehow um, um, move back in time and, um, and provide more um, sort of a social support and value uh, to those jobs, um, that would help enormously. I think that's better in some European countries, at least. I mean, in Germany and Holland and so on, where there are apprenticeships, what we need is not to, you know, people who fly planes yeah. should know how to fly planes. So that part of meritocracy is good. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of credentialization that doesn't seem to do anything. And we need other routes to dignity that don't involve getting a four-year college degree. So we're not pushing everybody to get a BA. Sorry. No, no, no. I mean, part of that comes though from uh, closing the wage gap. And as uh, you mentioned, the, we, we, we talk about the wage gap in the book, that the college premium went from a 40% premium in 1980 to more than an 80% premium today. I mean, that's just stunning. And part of that comes from falling real wages for people without a BA. But certainly a lot of it comes from the rising wages of people with a BA. Um, it's much easier to have a stable life if you have a livable income and um, you're not spending a lot of it on uh, the social programs that the state could provide and that elsewhere are often provided. So I think we might um, have some time for either um, Massimo wants to respond or take questions from It would be nice audience. to see some of the, I'm for, worried that we might lose the questions for lack of time. I so. have, I have okay, a, I, can, I can I stop here, question. Claudio, if there are questions. Yes, please. Uh, say, well, it's a big question. And uh, say, the point is, if you had to advise about uh, the implementation of a repair policy, so what would be the basic ingredients? So is there a way out? Of I think you have to bring healthcare costs under control. That seems to be almost impossible in this country. Um, I think you need to ultimately stop financing politics this way, um, which is probably also impossible too. Um, financing healthcare um, in a better, more US way would be better. I think a value added tax here is, is perhaps possible and would really help. So, for instance, these multi-billionaires are effectively not paying any tax at all now. And at least if there was a value added tax, they would pay tax on what they spend, even if they don't pay any tax on what they earn. So I think that would really help. And I think there are there's a lot of interest in developing better um, you know, apprenticeship type programs in, conduct, in conjunction with industry and with firms at junior colleges, which don't involve a BA, but which do involve an alternative route to dignified work. I would just add one thing to that, which is that the Department of Justice here has fallen asleep on um, trying to protect us against monopolies and monopsonies. And so we think that a, a more um, active um, approach to try to rein in monopolists and, and, and people who are big um, buyers of labor as well, monopsonists, would also make a difference. And that's possible. Thank you. We still have uh, many questions and uh, probably very little time uh, for them. And I don't know whether you like to pick up uh, one or two questions, but it's, we, are, uh, we have just uh, probably two, three minutes left. I know that 
your time is, is almost uh, finished. So, um, one one question that that's, uh, is why is cardiovascular death not considered a death of despair? Um, cardiovascular disease is really important, and um, our progress against that is flatlined. But a lot of that seems to be because of people stopping being adherent to antihypertensives that they're being prescribed. Um, in a sense, you could think of almost a lot more things as being in the death of despair bucket, but we wanted to be conservative and just put in the bucket things that we thought we could definitely put our hands on our hearts and say, this should not happen. This should not happen in midlife. Um, uh, you could see the mic now. Do you think, Claudia, you could send the questions to us when we're done? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yes, I do. Apologies. I think there are questions in the chat. There are questions in the chat rather than in the in the QA. So in the chat, I I seen that there were a few of them and also discussion about uh, Let's see if if I can find another question here for was was in the in the chat. Um... Yeah, one one big difference between the literature on wage premiums and the health literature, which in some ways are parallel. You know, there's a health premium to education as well as a money premium, is that we actually think that giving people education is like enhancing their earnings ability. Whereas giving people education, we don't, I think, think automatically gets into your body and makes you healthier. It's much more to do with the role in society that that does. So it's not like building up health capital in, in the way that you think of education as building up human capital, which makes it more amenable in some ways because it's social arrangements that are the problem here. Um, not the inherent properties of education. Just to add another point, which I find interesting, we have all this parallelism between, for example, political ground between uh, America and US with uh, Blue Corlands, which if rich in alliance. But I think there is some, some other difference. In Europe, at least, immigration is the key word. I mean, it's not so much. Uh, outsourcing or globalization, but the fact that, that uh, you know, uh, right. right party um, um, promised to protect uh, workers from immigration. It's a huge problem here too. And we talk about it in the book. Uh, I think, you know, the economists tend to say immigration is not a problem and there's any amount of work claiming that that's not true. And we're a bit skeptical of that. Um, and, but I think there are certainly severe social consequences and right wing politicians here. I mean, you know, Trump started his career by insulting Mexicans and by insulting Obama. So race and immigration uh, was absolutely at the core of his nativist thing. So we don't have the numbers that you have there, um, but we have. You know, we have a very similar problem on the Mexican border that you Italians have across the Mediterranean there. So I don't think it's so different. Let, let, let me just ask the most terrifying question. Is Trump going to win again? <laughs> Hell. <laughs> Can we come to Italy? <laughs> You're welcome, very welcome. <laughs> Well, maybe uh, provided you promise not to reelect Berlusconi. Um, <laughs> he, he might become president of the Republic, you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, we're a bit worried about um, Tucker Carlson, too. Um, <laughs> that, you know, politics has become television and television is becoming politics. And that is a very dangerous place to be. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, it's a uh, time to to close this webinar, I know that uh, your time is uh, is over. So I would like to take the chance to thank you very much for uh, your uh, presentation. And um, there, are, uh, there is a explicit request for uh, the slides uh, of the of today's webinar. In the case uh, you you may can make it.
them uh, available. Yeah, could you could you also send us Massimo slides, please? And if you could save the chat and send that to us, that would be excellent. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's really great to benefit from all this commentary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Wonderful to talk with you. Hope to meet you in person sometime. I hope so too. This is a poor substitute. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.